Hey there, I'm Dan McFadden, and welcome to an episode of Dropping the Hammer. Uh, on this week's episode, I have a, an exclusive interview with the newly announced driver for GMS Racing's Cup Team in 2022, Ty Dillon. Uh, I got to talk to him last week, just a few days after that team uh, made its official announcement at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Uh, in many ways, this is a follow-up interview to what I to what I did with Ty Dillon back in February. Uh, when he was setting out on a part-time schedule racing for Joe Gibbs Racing in the Xfinity Series. Uh, that was seven months ago, um, and since then he's raced for teams like Our Motorsports, uh, Gaunt Brothers Racing, and Jordan Anderson Racing, all pretty much all in the Xfinity, seri Xfinity Series except for his Gaunt Brothers Racing starts. Um, one of the more interesting parts about this interview is we, we address uh, the, the podcast episode that Ty uh, released back in early March where he, you know, sort of said, I quit. He, he talked about how he had, like, just, you know, kind of reached the kind of the end of his rope uh, when it came to the struggles of trying to find a, a new racing job somewhere. And we, we talk about uh, just athlete mental health and why he thinks that's, that's an important discussion to be having uh, in our current day and age. Um, but we'd, we'd also talk about the next-gen car, because he just did a, did the two-day test of the next-gen car with GMS Racing at uh, the Charlotte Motor Speedway Road Course last week. So we get his thoughts on that, uh, joining GMS Racing next year, um, and kind of returning to the RCR, Richard Chills Racing, ECR umbrella after t taking his brief uh, detour to Toyota Racing. So here is my exclusive interview with... Uh, GMS Racing's Ty Dillon. <laughs> so, so which, which shop are you on the way to? Uh, GMS. Okay. So yeah, B yes. big news for you, man. Um, yeah. What, what's the what's the last week been like? Oh man, it's been a crazy weekend uh, with the announcement and just uh, everything really kind of came together um, throughout the the previous week and then into the announcement. Uh, we were, you know, still finishing a lot of the agreements and stuff. So um, then getting to the racetrack, racing on Saturday in the Xfinity race, we had a really good race going there and went literally from like fourth to 26th between running out of gas, getting penalized and all kinds of stuff at the end of that race. Um, and then coming back Saturday for the announcement, which was really awesome. Um, and then Saturday night, uh, you know, life reality hit, or I think, yeah, Saturday night, no, Sunday night after the announcement uh, my daughter got a stomach bug so we were up with her she had a 24-hour <laughs> stomach bug so it was like reality kind of set in of uh you know life still goes on hold on one second I'm gonna get get my order real quick <laughs> yeah so uh we um and then the next morning Monday was you know after doing that all night was the test so um, it was really, the test was really fun. It was, it was cool to get behind the wheel of that car and just start learning and, and downloading as much as I could mentally about, um, the car and what we needed. And, you know, it was, uh, I've never really been a part of a new test of a whole new car, which I don't think anybody mm -hmm. really has. So, um, and then I think for, for our, uh, for our team, you know, just being there was, was, uh, you know, getting a car built and being there to be able to make laps was a huge, huge thing. So, uh, you know, we're still in the process of trying to hire crew chief and okay. engineers and kind of building out our team. So we had a lot of guys step up from the truck side that have never really, uh, you know, worked on the, the cup stuff before, but we had a good leader, uh, Joey Cohen, who's kind of stepped up and kind of taken charge of building uh, these cars as, as we assemble our team. Um, so we did a good job just uh, you know, being able to run a bunch of laps, spend time on the car, um, uh, and, and getting the test, you know, doing some things in the test that allowed us to learn more. So uh, it was a wild, wild, busy weekend, and, uh, you know, we're still kind of at work right now. I think it's a, it's a bit of a slight advantage that we don't have to race in the Cup Series for the next couple of weeks, that we can mm -hmm. just kind of hammer down on being as well prepared for the next next test and rolling into next season as much as we can and like this as a driver you, you're kind of you kind of came up in the generation where you guys weren't allowed to test so so yeah. this whole 
I guess two days of it at one track like that. That's kind of a new newish thing for you in a way. Yeah, kind of. I was at the very tail end of it. So like when I was ARCA racing and starting truck racing, um, there was still pretty much open testing going to Nashville like almost okay. every week. And, uh, you know, the truck drivers of a team were kind of the guys that would go do those tests. So I was, you know, testing trucks and Xfinity cars and every once in a while I'd get behind a cup car if it was like a wheel force car or something that they were learning with. And, um, you know, I, I was a part of a lot of those tests um, kind of early on in my career. And then they've certainly tailed off to nothing the last you know five or six years, but uh, I've definitely been there before. So, so we're, we're where was before you go going into this test what were your expectations for that car and by the end of it where, where do you think you were as far as your understanding of what that car is and can do um yeah you know i i you know i didn't i didn't set any expectations right so i you know i expected anything um and whether it was going to be really hard or or uh, didn't drive well but, uh, you know, I was, I was hopeful it was going to be everything that you want it to be as far as like a modern car where you can drive really hard. It reacts to steering inputs and driving inputs really well. And I, I think it was all of that and more. So it's a fun race car to drive. I know that's uh, kind of cliche to say because race cars are fun to drive in general. But <laughs> um, it, 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 you can really be aggressive and learn a lot um, with just kind of the modern components that are on the car I mean we've been racing components on on cup cars um you know five hundred thousand dollar cup cars that are 30 40 years old so when you get some modern technology base parts built in there it just makes it a nicer car so um yeah it was it was really fun. a lot to learn um you can drive them really hard which is cool and uh, yeah so i i it, it's uh, exceeded my expectations obviously there's some some parts and pieces that uh, we're going to have to learn and, and improve on, I think, across the field in NASCAR. Um, some of the, uh, I guess, I don't know, the, the manufactured parts that we're having to, to receive now. So that's just a different challenge, I think, for all of us teams and everything. Is it's the first car that will race competitively that probably only 10% of the car is actually manufactured inside the race shop. So, mm. um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's quite a challenge when you're taking somebody else's manufactured piece and you're having to trust trust the work that's being done outside your building and that you really have no idea how the quality control of that part that's being made is, is done. So um, there's going to be a lot of, I'd say, growing pains and processes built into developing this car. And uh, so that making all the laps, uh, you, you can make all the laps because I think you'll see the people who are very successful out of the gate. Um, they'll have the least amount of failures with, with all this. So uh, you're going to have to be very detailed in your preparation. And, um, you know, almost over, over crossing T's and dotting I's to make sure everything works. What surprised you the most about it, the car? Um, I just think the braking capability, um, you know, obviously not having a solid rear axle or axle across the, you know, the rear, uh, rear end across the back of the car we have independent suspension those are two things so the role of the car and what the car liked compared to other things um uh, i think having the the rub blocks all the way underneath the car you know we're used to hitting just the splitter or the chassis uh having some solid rub blocks on the car is quite a unique thing uh you hit those before you hit uh, the body of the car so those are just some different things that are different feels um, obviously the shifting being straight in line and five gears, that was a, a unique challenge and, um, not a challenge. It was, it was really fun. Um, and there's some things there to learn and improve on as a driver, as you get four laps, it's, uh, it's kind of cool starting at zero because you can, you can tell there'll be things that, you know, 50 races from now or a year from now, or even 10 races from now, you'll be so much more comfortable with, there'll be more second nature, but right now you're trying to find your groove with with different processes with you know the the rear view camera for a mirror which is just a whole mind bender in itself it just doesn't seem right <laughs> um, and then the way the, the dash is laid out and uh you have to sit in the car the heat is different so there's just um you know it's a it's like walking into a new job it's a 
you got a lot to learn, a lot of people, a lot of dynamics, a lot of things to, to learn. And um, I guess I am walking into a new job with a new car. So it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a lot at once, but it's, it's super exciting. So, so, so the, 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 the rear view camera, you call it a mind bender. Describe the, the, that sensation of, I guess, looking into that. What, what, how's that different from looking into a normal rear view mirror? Yeah, I, I just think there's so many factors in it. Um, when it's a when it's a camera, it moves with the body of the car. So if there's soft suspension, the camera can move up and down depending on you know undulation of the racetrack hmm. uh, because the camera is mounted in a different place than actually what you're viewing. Uh, so there's a little bit of disconnect there. Okay. Um, there's variable zooms on the camera. Uh, there's different angles that you might want it tilted at. Um, and it's a digital display that has LED, you know, lights behind it instead of just an actual real, you know, rear view mirror that you're looking <laughs> and you see the you know, exact thing. So um, I'm hoping the adjustment to that will, will grow a little bit easier. We definitely have some work to do on our setup. I thought it would be easier to mount it lower, kind of closer to me. Um, but you, you re I realized when I got out there, like my natural tendency is to look where the rear view mirror is not to look down uh, and take my eyes off the road. So that was something that I had to change that needs to be changed uh, kind of immediately. And, um, you know, I think getting through the test, we actually put a regular mirror back in our car just to make sure I wasn't pulling out in front of people. And um, you don't realize how much you utilize that mirror, just, just getting in and out of the garage and getting out on the track, getting down pit road. Um, and if you don't have, you know, a great setup on your rear view mirror camera where you can't see the things that you're used to seeing, it can, uh, can be stressful. Okay. So I, I know to, either Monday or Tuesday when you, you did a press conference during the test, you said you spent a lot of time just crawling around in the car, like l looking, looking for stuff, trying to figure out what you were dealing with. So like, what, what's that cockpit like? Like how, how is that different from like, like, I guess I know you were you drove some races from Forgot Brothers Racing this year, but like compared to the cockpit of the car you drove for Jermaine Racing at Phoenix last year, how yep. different is that cockpit? Um, it, it's quite a bit different. So the uh, center section of the chassis that everybody's running is um, it's just built different. You sit, you know, the seating position is actually a little bit lower. The um, the door bars of the car are built in higher. The uh, dash bars are higher so you feel like you're lower so your seat position is actually a little bit higher it's a little bit spaced out different um, you don't have a dash in the car um, you have just your um, your digital readout dash but you know we've forever we've had these big carbon build outs in the car that almost encapsulate the driver now we just have open bars it's a little bit different feel a little bit different look but for me all that stuff is you know it's somewhat comfort but it's all about my visual how i look out the car what i see when i look out the front windshield and the back i think the biggest thing is is this it is hard to get out of the cars uh, out of a regular rear view you, you kind of need that camera so that's probably the biggest thing internally and then you know part of my comment about just getting out of the car and watching you know learning from the guys working on the car to see the different parts how they work and i think it just helps me to uh just communicate better to the team um, you know, when I feel something in the race car, whether it's good or bad, or I like that feel, or it's some, coming from this part of the, you know, this area in the car, I can kind of self-diagnose it to give them more information and help yeah. them make decisions as we're all learning. So, um, uh, I think it's important to, to know what you're working on and know what you're driving. Um, if I want to become a part of that car when I'm in it, um, and really become one with it, I've got to know what's, uh, what it's made of. So, mm. um, that's just kind of my, my theory on that. So how, how, like you said, said, you know, you're starting at zero. So how do you think you're going to have to like change the vocabulary you use with this car compared yeah. to what you've done in the past? Like your descriptors to your crew chief will be, will they be different or like how, how much of a change will that be? Yeah, that's, it's definitely going to be a change. I think, you know, I think in any business communication is, is key relationships are key. So I think, uh, you know, the direction that we go in crew chief and, and kind of building out our whole team, it's, it's going to matter in how we communicate, you know, hopefully I can take things that I was very confident in describing a, a cup car, you know, a past cup car, the current cup car, 
um, that I knew the feel that I know is not in this car, but mm-hmm. the feel might relate uh, when we make a change that is a new change or a new new component. Kind of just taking that conversation and then discussing it together. Of okay, this is the feel, but it's on a it's coming from a different part. Maybe there's a little bit of a little bit a few things different that it feels when we do this. But okay, so if I if I want the feel that this part on the old car gave me, I know maybe this is an area that we can work on mm-hmm. in the new car and. And uh, it is not going to be easy. I don't think it's going to be any easy for anybody in that. But uh, it's just a matter of, I think that's why it's important to have a crew chief and technical directors and, and engineers that are, are people that you communicate well with, because there's going to have to be a lot of discussions and vulnerable con- discussions of, I don't know what this is. I don't know why it feels this way, but this is kind of a similar feel. And really knowing each other in that way is going to you know, help develop your team. Okay. So I guess like get, getting into the GMS of it all, um, like the last time we talked was, you know, towards the end of February. Um, and the last time I yeah. really heard any, anything out of you was when you released your podcast on March 8th saying, you know, I quit today <laughs> and you talking about yeah. uh, th- that whole episode for yourself. Um, so, it, so it's seven months later, like what have the last seven months been like for, for Ty Dillon? Yeah, I just wanted to have a like a real conversation that podcast and, and you know I still hope to this day that that podcast isn't received as I quit you know I actually quit on the day it was more about a conversation of like some days you wake up and you have a hard time and it's okay to have a hard time it was more of a mental health discussion and um, you know the importance of having good people surrounding you and um, it's it more gratitude towards my family and my wife and um, and my faith about, you know, sometimes you want to give up. And, you know, I felt that way a couple of days previous of, of, uh, of making the podcast of, man, I just, you know what, I don't want to have to keep going through the stress of worry about providing for my family and this job. And is it going to work out? Like in that moment, it was hard. And, and, you know, that continued. I was really, it's a tough time. You want, you want to race and you want to, um, you know, you want to be a part of, of a team again, but also the, the pain of like continuing to hear no's and situations not working out. You know, you just, it's easy to just say, you know what, whatever, I give up, I'll go, you know, find a different job in a different direction. And maybe this isn't made for me. And, um, you know, I, I kept going, kept fighting, kept making phone calls, kept getting opportunities, um, you know believing that it was you know if it was meant to be it was going to work out and, um, you know um, I'm so grateful the the connection was made with with GMS Mike Beam Maury Gallagher and it just uh, it started coming together uh, in, in such a organic good way and uh, you know I'm, I'm so thankful to have this opportunity and feel so good for it uh, I'm grateful for the work put in and, but I also know that you know things things happen for a reason so uh it's a it's been a wild year in a sense and I wouldn't say I'd want to do it again but I do think it was necessary for me to go through that I feel like I've grown and matured it's put things in a in a different viewpoint of perspective of why I love racing and why I want to be a part of racing I think in the past a lot of my motivation was based off of uh, fear of failure and fear of not impressing people uh with my skill um now my motivation is just pure love of the sport, pure love of, of waking up every day and working on being just a little bit better, no matter the results, but, but, you know, pushing myself and growing in a team and growing relationships, enjoying the ride of actually enjoying the ride of a career that is so, so fun and so cool and trying not to be jaded and just worrying about, you know, the perception of me of, am I finishing good or, and things like that. And I think that having more of a pure motivation like that is just, uh, it's, uh, it's easier to get up and, and work hard every single day when you, when you see it in that, that light. So I'm grateful for, for the hard times because it definitely, uh, you know, makes you, makes you stronger. Like, so you, I mean, you mentioned that, that the podcast you did is part of like a mental health discussion and athlete mental health has been in the conversation a lot this year. 
uh, with like Simone Biles at the Olympics. Um, that the the one tennis player, I can't I can't think of her name right now off the top uh, of my head. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. So, uh, so what what has it been like for you seeing high profile athletes like that go through their struggles? Um, I just think it's I think it's refreshing. Um, and as an athlete, I think there is is pressures that people might not understand why you would want to take a break from doing something that is so fun and I think that is hard for people to understand and I totally get that right um some people work a night job uh and look forward to going out and playing a, you know a sport as a hobby or you know that was a great pastime as a kid but um anything professional at the highest level is stressful and demanding on your life um and anybody who's typically made it to a high level has sacrificed a lot of time in their life to be the very best. Um, it just isn't easy. Um, and when things go from being a fun hobby uh, to a job, everything changes. Uh, and I think being able, athletes being able to have the platform, I just think everything changes. Um, you know, the demands, uh, you have so many more people. Uh, pulling you in different directions it's a job right it is a yeah. it is a fun thing that you do but it is a very serious job it's your livelihood and there's a lot of pressure and you have a lot of fans there's a lot of responsibility and don't get me wrong like being a professional athlete is one of the greatest jobs to have but it doesn't it doesn't um i guess denounce the fact that it's hard uh, emotionally and mentally uh and physically when you're when you're exerting that much that often it can't it has to affect you mentally um, unless you spend all your time recovering your body and your mind then you have no time for relationships in life and it, and it just makes things really tough so there's a massive balance I think for athletes and um, I think part of the mental health discussion is healing within itself um, athletes feeling comfortable to say hey like I'm not I need a I need a second to kind of gather my mind because I loved this sport and I think that's kind of what I'm saying like as a kid I was motivated by you know motivated by the pressure of performance and motivated by the pressure of uh, pleasing other people and then as you grow and mature that motivation is more toxic than it is helpful as your career goes on and I think it is helpful for athletes to take a step back and realize what they love about the sport. And I think that's kind of the mental health grow growing area where, um, where I think fans might get it, you know, it might be hard to understand sometimes, but you really have to put sport in, in a good place in your heart to where it's enjoyable again, even though it's a professional level sometimes, uh, because typically if you're a professional athlete, you started when you were a child and yeah. it was all fun. Um, uh, but you've sacrificed a lot of time, then all of a sudden you're, you're grown and you're in this, this world of sports, whether you've had success or not. Um, and the pressures and demands on your life are so different. And all you really want to do is just, you know, enjoy the ride and enjoy your friends and your family and the fun of it again. Um, but you're constantly pulled to do media and different things. And I think um, as you grow, you just have to find that place in your heart and that place in your mind of, um, you know, a pure joy of what you do. And I think it's always like the mental health discussion is so it, it's a great thing that it's happening across sports because um, you see so many athletes struggle with different things and, and whether their career ends or they're, they're in the middle of their career. Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very important uh, discussion. It's hard to describe from outside of an athlete's uh, mm -hmm. point, I think. You know, when you've, you've lived this adrenaline and high of expectation and fandom and um, that comes with being a professional athlete. And then when you realize that, you know, there's more, you know, you have a lot of life to live after sport and you've been so used to this one thing that drove you. I just think that it's a really important discussion to have. And when when athletes kind of take a stand for something, I remember in NASCAR, it was Dale Jr. sitting out for the first concussion. Um, that was a massive moment in the sport now where we have protocols and it's okay. You're not, a, you're not afraid to, to talk about your um, physical health 
yeah. um, and, and taking a break for that. Um, and I think mental health is something that is so important to life in general um, that, you know, it's more about taking care of humans than it is making sure your favorite athletes uh, you know, on the court or on the field or on the track every single time that you want to see them. Um, and, and I think you're only going to get better athletes from allowing a more, more open-minded, uh, mental health discussion. Okay. So, so you, you that's mentioned... kind of deep and probably <laughs> rambled, but that's, no, that's fine, man. I, I love that. Um, so like yeah. you, you said, GMS racing, it, this came together organically. Like, so at what point in the last few months did this conversation start to happen for you? Um, I'd say it came, first conversations came during the summer break for the Olympics. Okay. Um, some of the calls were started there and, um, you know, none of these deals are just a one call, Hey, we're going to do this and, and, uh, you know, be ready to sign tomorrow kind of deal. <laughs> uh, you know, things, a lot of things had to come together. Uh, a lot of discussions, um, GMS side of, you know, what direction they wanted to go in, how many races they want to run, are we going to go full-time or not? Or, um, you know, how we felt like the team was going to be built out and the relationships that we need to be made and um, sponsors and ideas and how can we make this work? And that was, um, you know, as those conversations came, I think the organic part that I talk about is, is more or less just the natural relationship that was so easy to start between myself and Mike Beam and, and Maury Gallagher of, Hey, we have chemistry here that I think good things are going to come from this relationship. So um, that's the very exciting part for me is, uh, working for two guys so far that are so easy to talk to and communicate and, and very clear and transparent about their goals, their intentions, uh, and for me and the race team. So uh, I think that's that's probably my favorite part of, of the beginning of this relationship. So when when did you get when did you sign on the dotted line? When when did that book actually become official? Uh, that was uh, I believe it was. Thursday afternoon last week oh okay so fairly fairly recent okay so yeah there was a lot of things that came out like obviously we had been talking I think people see me around we had we had our car built and I had sat in it but you know the official signing was in the last week or so yeah so after everything you, you like after everything you went through on March 8th and all that and then the, the ensuing seven months what was that moment for you signing that uh, it was, um, you know, it was so relieving. I, you know, just uh, an emotional, uh, you know, it, looked, it felt like a weight lifted off my shoulders, obviously, of stress and um, just kind of a emotional dump of gratitude, you know, and, and thankfulness uh, for the opportunity, um, the blessing that it is in general. Um, uh, and thankful for my wife and all the things that she had to put up with, with, with my stress and, and just supporting us with, with my, my kids and, and the day to day of the ups and downs. And she's just as passionate about me having a job as, as I am. And, um, you know, I'm just, I was just, it was so nice to have that. We're going to be back doing something that we love as a family again. And, uh, yeah, there's just so many emotions wrapped up into it. And uh, a bit of non-belief of like, is this really happening? You know, like, because so many, so many days you're spent trying to prepare your mind of it's over, which is not the right attitude to have, but you know, we're all human. And, uh, and then when it was, you know, when it's finally done, there's a little bit of like, now there's nothing that can go wrong. Right. Like this is, we're, we're doing this. Right. And uh, you, you mean, you know, you're, just you're, you're waiting that. for, you're waiting for someone to pull the rug out from underneath you. Right. Yeah. 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 And I just think, a lot of that just came from, you know, the way that 2019 ended. And then I was really working hard to try to get opportunities all the way up till, you know, January and February of this year. And uh, felt like I was on the doorsteps of getting opportunities for this year. And the rug was, I don't know, four or five times right at the last second, I felt like uh, pulled out from under me. And it was very disappointing and upsetting and uh, frustrating. But, you know, I kept going, kept going. And, um, not knowing when the next opportunity was going to come and um, to have something so good and so, uh, so real that, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's 
taking a little bit for it to settle in, but now it's, um, you know, I'm really excited and uh, I'm here to work. So like, the, so when we talked in February, we, we discussed how like at the time it seemed like you were kind of, you know, at peace with, you know, being completely away from the RCR umbrella. Uh, like you're, yeah. you're going, going to to Toyota, no connections to to your grandfather ecr engines all that but now but so but now you you're kind of back underneath that umbrella a little bit with i mean you the team will be getting support from ecr yeah. engines and stuff like that so so where, where are you in that and, and you being your relationship now again being tied at least a little bit to the organization yeah. of that your grandfather has built yeah i mean i think it's great like i think people might not understand that like I don't really have a say in where I'm going, you know, like I, I can't just be like, Hey, I want to, I can tell my grandfather, you know, I'd love to drive for you. Like, I think he knows that he knows that he wants, he would love to have his grandson drive for him too. And, uh, but it, there was nothing there in at the beginning of this year. And there mm -hmm. was opportunity with, with Toyota and, and Gaunt brothers and Gibbs and, um, so like, I'm so grateful for those opportunities. And, you know, when, when I'm into an opportunity and someone's giving me a chance, I'm all in for them. Um, but it doesn't take away from relationships that you have. Um, and, and, you know, the things come around and the world works in funny ways. And, um, you know, it, I'm, I've never discounted the fact that I would ever not run for, for a team associated with my grandfather and never wanted to not be so, um, I'm grateful that I am with a team that is associated with my family again. And um, yeah, it's, it, it's cool how it's all worked out and um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity, but like, it was never that I really had a choice of where I was going to race. You know, it was, um, it was, I guess in a sense I've had, I've had choices uh, uh, in the fact of like choosing a team that was right for me or right for my family. Um, but like, I guess there wasn't really choices. It was like, do this or, or not race, you know? Yeah. So, um, um, so like, there's never been a factor of didn't want to race for my grandfather or only wanted to race for people with a di different manufacturer. It was mm -hmm. more or less like us having the opportunity to get to race again in general. So, for, for, so from this year, you, like you mentioned, you, you raced for Joe Gibbs Racing, Gaunt Brothers, uh, Jordan Anderson Racing, uh, our, our motorsports. That, 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 that's an eclectic group of, of teams to be, to, to be racing for this year. I think, I think um, sun, Sunday morning or whatever you said, you were on the pit road Saturday and you, you felt like you had raced for most of the numbers on pit road. So, Yeah. Yeah, part of my routine is going down pit road and looking at our pit stall and pit sign. And um, it was funny because I was driving the 23 car, but the pit crew is the 37 cup team. And I was like, so what's our pit sign? They're like, well, we have a 23, but we don't know where the sign is. <laughs> so we're just going to use a 37 today. And I'm like, it doesn't matter at this point. Half the numbers down pit road I've ran from 54, 96, 23, 02, 31, like, I ran so many numbers this year, but I'm really grateful to get to meet that many people and work with that many different uh, companies. Uh, I feel like I'm learning a lot more than just being a race car driver um, for my career and for my life. And um, I, I'm grateful for the, all the people I've met and worked with and they've all been really great. So if, if I, so I was looking at your racing reference page for, for this season. So if, if I had told you like when you went off to Toyota, that your best finish uh, of the season uh, would, would come for like our motorsports or Jordan Anderson racing and not Joe Gibbs racing. What would your reaction have been? I would have been surprised. I would have been surprised that I raced for the teams that I raced for this year, I think. Um, but like, yeah, I don't know. Like that's just kind of another thing of like puts things in perspective about racing, like, and, and why the work is so important to me. Uh, over the results uh, because certainly the 54 Joe Gibbs racing team is you know top of the top of the series right now yeah and those cars were extremely fast every time I drove them and um, we went to Daytona probably had one of the you know strongest runs of anybody and got caught up in the crash 
uh, we went the next week to uh, Homestead and we, we were so fast that we chose not to pit um, in the middle of the stages and we had two sets of tires more than everybody in the field laying and were set up in a really, really good position just the way we had kind of drawn it up and had a bolt go through the radiator and blow the engine. And then you go to Vegas, um, I spun out and burn up a set of tires coming through the field at the beginning of the race, um, then got caught up in a crash as uh, my the spotter's radio went dead as I was uh, coming off the corner in the back, back stretch. And mm. uh, just like weird circumstances with really, really fast race cars. Um, I have no doubt that if I would have ran a season long, I would have won races there. Uh, they have a great team. Uh, Chris Gale is an incredible crew chief and, uh, you know, obviously Ty and, and Kyle and everybody that's got in it have been, have been successful as well. So, uh, but then you get into a car that, you know, the team is, uh, you know, a win for them is a top, top seven, top five. And yeah. um, you do the same, I did the same process driving that car and uh, we go to Charlotte and we were running 15th all day. A bunch of crashes happen. I'm, you know, I, I execute on restarts and I finish sixth or seventh. And then we go to, you know, you just go to these places and things happen and you're in, in good positions. We go to Vegas and had a really strong race. We went to Atlanta and, uh, you know, chose to stay out. I was driving up through the field. I think I was probably a fourth, fifth place car. And I think we finished fourth there. And um, you just never know. Like, that's why the work of it becomes fun. It's not about always about the results. Um, there's only one winner. There's so many things that can go wrong in a, in a NASCAR race. Um, so yeah, to me, that was just another, um, kind of driving home the point to myself of like, it's about the, the work put in, fall in love with the process of being a driver, you know, physically, mentally pre preparing, and then just enjoying the race and doing my best at what I can control. So like you, you mentioned Las Vegas, you led 17 laps in that race for, for Jordan yeah. Anderson. Like, so what was that like? I like after everything you, you've been through this year, leading 17 laps at Las Vegas in a Jordan Anderson car, what was like, what was that like for you? Yeah, I think for me, it was just, uh, I still got this, you know, like it's the first time I've been leading in a long time other than stage win at Roval and in the, in the cup car. Yeah. And, uh, to be able to lead laps knowing that you were at a tired disadvantage, you know, like those situations where you don't have the advantage over the field and you still excel are the moments where I feel like um, it's a pure confidence booster for myself of I can do this. I can do this at a high level. I can do it with the best of the best. Um, so now it's just a matter of executing from here on out in my career that when I get the opportunity to lead laps and get up front, I can do it as well as anybody. Um, so that's my, it's just another confidence recheck. You know, I think the, really the last one I've had was, uh, obviously the Roval was a big, um, uh, stage win moment, but probably bigger than that, as far as a confidence check was that Bristol went in the stage against Clint Boyer on older tires and he's driving a Stuart Haas car and I'm in a Germain car. And, um, uh, you know, that was in the height of Stuart Haas's run with Harvick, like to be able to beat him straight up on a green white checker, that was a huge moment for me. Um, there's little moments that, you know, people might not see, I think, uh, starting on the pole at Darlington on the back to back, uh, when we, when the, you know, the, the field was flipped from starting position, and, um, having four restarts where I was the leader, um, mm -hmm. and two of them were against Joey Logano straight up. So, um, those are moments that I know when it all comes together and hopefully it's here at Jermaine or <laughs> uh, GMS, um, I can get the job done. Okay. So you, you we, we only got like four four weeks left of, of the season. It's like what, what are you set to be racing at all the next four weeks? Not currently. Um, okay. I would love to be in, in in a car of some sort or a truck of some sort going to Phoenix. Just kind of something to finish off the year, uh, kind of book in the year. But I'm also very comfortable knowing that we have you know tests in November, tests in December, and January, like every month from here on out. Okay. Um, with this new car and uh, just I can really dig in and work hard on that so you, you're still looking for a crew chief you're, you're going to be getting into a new car so how, how does this new car maybe change what you look for in a crew chief uh, 
yeah, I think it's a it's a clean slate for everyone, right? So I think you throw out everybody's track record with the old car and okay, all that's new. I think it it comes to um, you want somebody that has a successful mindset, but you also want to have somebody that is uh, a good communicator because I think your relationship, if you can't communicate with your relation with your with your crew chief now, in a time where communication is going to be so key, learning a new car you're going to struggle. So I think the relationship between myself and the crew chief are going to be um, the most important thing, especially for a new, brand new race team. Uh, so that that's kind of the biggest first thing on the list. And um, if our communication is clean, we're going to build, build a strong program. All right. So since you're going to be driving the 94 next year, I want to strongly encourage you for the Darlington throwback race to do a Batman Forever Bill Elliott throwback. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> yes, that would be awesome. Great call. Yeah, like, I, I like that. I'm a huge uh, Batman fan, so. So I, I, I don't know, <laughs> like, if you get in trouble with Warner Brothers or anything for put it, for simply putting Batman Forever on, on the car yeah. t- 26 years after that movie came out, but you should try. <laughs> yeah, totally. totally. At least put the bat symbol, you know? On yeah. the hood. Absolutely. And have like a whole Batman suit that looks like the old, you know, that Batman Forever suit. That'd yeah. be awesome. Do it. It it, the, the, it started here. This is where it started. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I mean, I'll give you credit. <laughs> All right.